If you haven't joined one of our previous webinars, my name is Jason Slocum. I'm a director of product management here for Bentley's iTwin platform, and I'll be your moderator again for this uh, month's webinar. If you've attended one of our past webinars, you're probably already familiar with this ON24 web interface. But just in case, I'd like to remind everyone of the menu at the bottom of your screen, which lets you navigate between, between the webinar windows. I'd encourage all of you to submit your questions during the presentation using the Q&A option. And then at the end of the presentation, we'll go back and address all those questions. I'd also like to remind you that the windows are all removable and resizable. And that might help as you're going to be seeing some code snippets throughout this webinar. Uh, put a few more helpful tips up here on the screen for you. Um, you know, this is a, a streaming platform. There is no dial-in number for attendees. So make sure you have the audio coming through your speakers or headphones. Be aware, um, you know, the webinar can be a bit bandwidth intensive. So if it's uh, you're seeing any um, performance issues or, or if you lose audio or otherwise, uh, we recommend that you do refresh the window in order to uh, bring it back up. All right, with all that housekeeping work out of the way, get on to the main event here. I'm excited to be joined today by Matt Gooding, who is a principal software engineer here at Bentley. And today, Matt's going to share how you can connect an I model into Unity for visualization. And from there, he's going to go in and show you how to stream graphics and metadata using a sample that's up on GitHub called iModel Unity Example. And then he's going to show you how to extend that example with custom code to query information from the iModel. Then he'll wrap up with sharing some tips for optimizing the performance of a Unity application uh, with the iModel in it. And then, as I mentioned, we'll come back and take your questions after the presentation. So with all that uh, laid out, I'm going to turn it over to Matt. Hi, everyone. My name is Matt Gooding, and I'm a software engineer working on Bentley's iTwin platform. Today, I'm going to be talking about how to connect the Unity game engine to the iTwin platform. Hopefully, if you're attending this webinar, you have some familiarity with the iTwin platform already. But briefly, it's Bentley's solution for aggregating data from disparate engineering sources together in a common API to facilitate the creation and management of digital twins. For more information, please visit our website at developer.bentley.com. And to uh, find more information about the particular APIs that we're going to be talking about today, you can go to itwinjs.org. Now, uh, you may or may not already be familiar with uh, the other part of today's presentation, the Unity Game Engine. Um, Unity is one of the most popular uh, game engines along with uh, Unreal. It's uh, very popular with game developers, um, but it's also widely used in uh, the AEC space. Um, there are a few reasons why. Um, Unity provides a common platform for many devices, including augmented reality, virtual reality, uh, desktop, um, mobile, and many niche devices like Caves and uh, others. Um, it has an intuitive uh, programming environment. Uh, you, you write your programs in C-sharp, and there is a lot of uh, excellent tooling uh, from Visual Studio, JetBrains, and others. Um, it has a really strong uh, ecosystem for gamification and simulation um, via its asset store, where you can find uh, lots and lots of plugins um, along with um, code extensions and uh, kind of whatever you're looking for. Um, it's also developed a, a very uh, robust um, free and open sourced uh, ecosystem. If you search for Unity on uh, GitHub, you will find lots and lots of uh, very well maintained and popular projects um, to uh, extend Unity in lots of different directions and provide a lot of uh, common functionality um, that might not quite be in the engine yet. Um, and the other big uh, positive point for uh, leveraging Unity is that it's uh, become, along with Unreal, um, one of the defaults for doing high-level uh, 3D development. If you are integrating with a new device or um, 3D platform, um, very often there is a Unity um, SDK available for it. Um, Microsoft uh, has done a lot of uh, great work making uh, this the easiest way to develop for HoloLens, uh, both with uh, the, the base SDK um, 
the MRTK uh, library that provides a lot of um, interactions and uh, UI elements, um, the Azure Remote Rendering Service, um, which uh, natively ties in and lets you uh, uh, render enormous models, um, and lots of other third parties uh, integrate as well, like Mapbox and uh, whatnot. So um, what makes uh, the iTwin platform and uh, Unity uh, a good match? Um, well, I think I described why uh, Unity is appealing for AR, VR, and uh, those other use cases. Um, iTwin is a really ideal way to feed uh, your Unity application uh, with AEC data. Um, we aggregate uh, from many uh, different AEC file formats, uh, many of which lack an existing pipeline to Unity, and even in the cases where there may be an existing pipeline, um, it can be very, very slow. Um, the aggregated data um, maintains its original uh, geometric representation. It's not just meshed at some predetermined level. Um, you know, we have spheres and cones and uh, surfaces of revolution and B reps and uh, B splines and all of that good stuff. Um, and this aggregated data uh, maintains its intelligence. All of the business properties and the or the metadata um, are persisted into uh, the I models. Uh, a base infrastructure schema or biz. Um, so uh, you're able to query uh, many data from many different file formats um, and display data from many different file formats using one common API. Um, and the really nice thing is uh, the iTwin platform is, uh, in particular iTwin.js, is offered as a open source API for Node.js so you can use it, um, as we will in the sample I'm going to show you, as a headless uh, uh, API that can either run locally on your machine or on a server. Um, you may have seen uh, some other solutions that uh, require you to have the design application open in order to, to query information from it. Um, we don't need to do anything like that. Um, our users uh, don't need to have um, anything special on their machines. <clears throat> and uh, even though you can run this um, on a server um, in a connected uh, workflow, you can also uh, run uh, Node locally uh, disconnected or on um, a closed network, say you were at a trade show or something, um, <clears throat> and you wanted to stream to a device. So it really is uh, uh, kind of the perfect way to, to feed your application. So. In today's webinar, um, I am going to be walking through um, our open source iModel uh, Unity example on GitHub um, and explaining how it works. Um, I'll show you how to extend uh, this example for custom use cases, and I will uh, talk about how you might leverage uh, the capabilities of iTwin.js to optimize performance for your application. Uh, by the end of the session, you should be able to make a demo Unity application that streams in your iModel uh, data on any platform that Unity supports, including uh, uh, AR and VR devices like the HoloLens, Oculus Quest, um, HTC Vive, you name it. So let's get started. So the first thing that we need to do is to clone the uh, repository for the example from GitHub. Um, you can find it at github.com, imodel.js, imodel unity example. So I'll copy the URL to my clipboard, open my command prompt, and pull it down. Okay, after you've cloned the repository, you can navigate to the node subfolder in the repository. And uh, I should note that uh, this project has the same uh, base requirements as uh, the iModel.js uh, monorepo, so you need Node 12 uh, in order to, to do this. Um, the other requirement that we have is uh, obviously you need Unity. Um, the project depends on Unity 2019 or later. Um, I'll be using Unity 2019.1 um, in this case, that's what I happen to have on hand, but uh, any 2019 version or 
2020 version, etc., should work as well. Okay, with a command prompt open, um, type npm install to install the necessary uh, npm packages. run build in order to compile the program and then npm start in order to launch the server great we're up and running now the next thing to do is to open the unity hub find your project Select the Unity subfolder. This is the directory that uh, will actually be recognized as a Unity project. And we're off and running. Well, we're off and importing anyway. We need to open the actual scene. Unfortunately, I can't specify uh, in the project which scene to start with. Once we've done that, we can push play. And voila, we've connected to the server. And we are streaming in our uh, iModel data. And if I switch back to my console window here, you'll see uh, we have lots of information about uh, what's happening uh, as we're rolling along. You can see when I connected, uh, my requests in order for setting the data up, um, and then my requests for all of the meshes uh, that went through. And we'll go into all of this in more detail um, later on. Um, but this gives you an idea of just how easy it is uh, to, to get uh, this up and running. Um, and again, you know, all of this is not pre-mashed data. This is all streaming from the, the real file, uh, the same one that you would open in any of our uh, samples that use our traditional web technologies. It's all created on the fly um, and uh, streaming in. Okay, so this was done using a uh, local snapshot file. Um, if we wanted to use uh, something from iModel Hub, um, there are a few more steps um, to go through. So uh, let's go through that next. Okay, the first thing that we need to do is go back to our uh, code. So in the node subfolder, there is a file called iModelHubDownload.ts. At the top of that file, uh, you'll find this iModel Hub request props, um, along with a command to uh, specify your own context ID and iModel ID. Um, we also have a link to the uh, iTwin.js uh, getting started uh, 
registration dashboard where you can find uh, any sample projects that you've uh, used uh, previously. So let's uh, open up that page. So I have some uh, projects that I've uh, pre-populated here. Um, you also could uh, create your own with our samples. Use a, a local file. It can be a DGN, DWG, or Revit file, or use iTwin Synchronizer. Um, and if you're using uh, iTwin Synchronizer, you have uh, lots more options. Uh, you can leverage any of the file formats that we support, which is a, a very long and growing list, as you can see. Okay, but for now, we are uh, just going to use one of these. So I'll click on Show IDs, Copy, Go back to my code, paste that in. Now these are formatted for um, the environment variable uh, uh, method that some of the other samples use. So we just need to paste them into JavaScript object. Okay, clear those out of there. Save. And then go back to the command prompt, stop my server, build. Okay. Um, one thing that I need to do differently now that I'm using uh, the iModel Hub uh, with the sample is instead of typing npm start, um, I'm going to type uh, node uh, lib main.js. And again, all of these instructions are uh, part of the README for the uh, GitHub project. Okay, so it's uh, telling me that uh, I'm not using a snapshot. I'm opening from iModel Hub. It's uh, attempting to sign in. I actually um, have my sign in cached. Um, the first time that you do this, um, it will ask you to, to sign in, um, and then uh, your, your sign in will be cached for the next uh, 30 days, so you should need to do that again. Um, I actually uh, have used this uh, previously in testing, so it had found that I had this briefcase cached and it's uh, using the, the local copy, and you can see my server is now running. So let's switch back to Unity. You can push play. And we're streaming in this uh, building sample. You'll notice that this model has textures, and let those come through without any issue. And yes, these uh, red blocks really are in the uh, in the model. <laughs> we would probably want to use uh, some uh, filtering uh, in our uh, graphics uh, select query in order to, to take that out. I'll, I'll talk about that a little bit later on. Um, real quick, let's just pick another project so you can see uh, how easy it is to swap these in and out. All right, so again, I'll stop my server, go back to the registration dashboard, uh, and this time we'll pick um, a larger project, the metro station model, copy that to the dash clipboard, paste that in. so you'll see the download message come through. All right, and we're 
all set. Go back to Unity. All right, now this is a larger model. Um, so the graphics will continue to stream in uh, over a longer time period. Um, but while it's streaming in, you can see that it's still interactive. I'm able to fly around. Yeah, no floors yet. Yep, yeah, I kind of. Filling in bit by bit. Now that we've shown um, the basics of how to uh, pull data from iModelHub, um, let's move on to talking a little bit about how this all works. Okay, so we'll start with the high level and then drill into some relevant details. The first thing to understand is that uh, connecting the iPad Twin platform to Unity uh, requires two separate processes. This is because iTwin is a JavaScript, TypeScript only API. It needs to run on uh, JavaScript engines like Node.js or one in your browser. So in our case, we have a Node.js process running the iTwin JS code and a Unity process running some standard Unity code. If we have uh, these two separate processes, then we need some way for them to communicate. For this example, I chose to use WebSockets, which is uh, an efficient uh, communication mechanism that works well whether the two processes are on the same uh, computer or on multiple devices. This lets us easily adapt the sample code for running purely on our desktop or connect it to a standalone device like the uh, Microsoft HoloLens or Oculus Quest, or uh, you know, if you had a remote server running, uh, providing the data to uh, your local desktop application. Really, any scenario uh, is, is possible uh, with this setup. Okay, so uh, if we have our two processes and we have our communication mechanism, the last thing we need is a format for that communication. Um, and in this example, I chose to use uh, protocol buffers for that. Uh, protocol buffers are a way to define um, a message schema and then have code generated for uh, lots and lots of different languages um, that leverages that uh, message schema. Um, they're very efficient, but uh, the really important uh, thing is just uh, having broad support. We want to be able to go from um, our iModelJS code to uh, Python, C Sharp, C++, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, um, and have uh, matching typed code uh, that we can use to uh, improve our velocity of, of getting work done. You can see an example of this here. Uh, on Google's site, um, they have the uh, .proto uh, message definition. They have what appears to be some Java code uh, that uh, writes uh, one of these messages, and then what looks like uh, some C++ code uh, that reads it in. And you'll see that we have something very similar um, in our example um, once we get a little bit further along. So. Let's go back here. Yeah. So putting it all together, um, the iModel uh, Unity example is a Node.js process running iTwin.js backend code, a Unity process connected to that uh, Node backend via WebSocket, and then the two uh, processes are sending messages to each other encoded as protocol buffers over that WebSocket. The Unity process always initiates uh, these messages. It sends them uh, uh, encoded as requests. The node process always uh, sends back one or more replies, messages at which we uh, term uh, as replies. And that's pretty much it. Um, next, we'll step through um, adding a new request reply pair, um, which will help give you a concrete understanding of uh, how this all works. Um, just briefly, I'll note that uh, this system is very similar to and inspired by gRPC. Um, I didn't actually use gRPC because uh, the Unity support was very new when I did this, and uh, the TypeScript support was actually uh, not really there. Um, you didn't get uh, uh, actual type definitions for any of your messages, which uh, I thought kind of defeated the, the point. Um, 
these days gRPC might be a better get answer um, if you're so inclined. Um, if you choose to, to do that, um, the system will port very cleanly over to it. Um, the request reply thing is uh, basically a gRPC service. Okay, um, so next we'll move on to looking uh, at uh, defining these request reply pairs uh, in practice. Okay, so we've opened up our imodelrpc.proto file uh, in the node subdirectory of our project. Um, this is the protocol buffer definition file, and you'll see at the top it has um, this uh, request wrapper message type and uh, this reply wrapper message type, and that both of them have this request ID field, along with um, both of them having a message field with uh, different nested types of messages. So the request wrapper is what is sent from Unity. It has an ID uh, to uh, pair these so that when the request, when the reply comes back, it knows that the reply went with uh, X request. Um, it has this message field um, so that we know what kind of message this is. This one of marks this as only being uh, one of these at a time. And we need this uh, because protocol buffer messages are not self-describing. So if you don't have a wrapper like this, you wouldn't know uh, what you were receiving. Okay, so in order to add um, another um, type, we need to put it in here. So let's put in example request and matching example reply. This is all just standard protocol buffer um, language work. Uh, if you look at the protocol buffer documentation, you'll see how to do all of this. Um, there's uh, plenty out there, lots of tutorials and whatnot. All right, so now that we've added these, let's add the actual message types at the bottom of our file. And we'll put in kind of a dummy field um, so that we can verify this working. We'll say that uh, our example request is going to ask for some text to be repeated back. And our reply is going to do that repetition. Okay, once we've put this definition in, um, then we can go back to our command prompt and run the proto build command from inside the node subdirectory. This is a node command um, that I've written to um, generate um, the JavaScript code, the accompanying TypeScript definitions, and the Unity code that goes with our protocol buffer. So now when we go um, to the protobuf RPC server uh, file in the node uh, subdirectory, you'll see that there are uh, different request handlers for the um, types of messages we're already able to do. So we just need to add in one for our new example request. Okay, so now we need to define that method. I'll go down to the bottom of this file. And example request. And you'll see that all of these take the form of socket i model. Although in our case we won't use the i model, so I'll put the uh, underscore and keep the linter happy. And request wrapper, which is just the TypeScript uh, class for um, what we just generated um, from our uh, protobuf definition. Okay, so to actually handle this request, I'll delete out my copy code. Let's find it in the field. And you'll see that uh, our VS Code IntelliSense has picked up the field we added. So we'll say we're going to be using the example request. We will assert that that is always defined. We know this function is only called if this is defined. So again, this is just keeping our linter happy. 
to find the repeated text in that definition, and we will make sure it's actually repeated. So this is our request type, text to repeat, and we'll put that in there. Now, once we have that, we need to send back our message. So um, you can see there are a few different parts uh, to one of these. Uh, the first thing is the, the socket, uh, where we will actually send the data. Um, and then uh, there is uh, the reply wrapper object, but when we send it over the socket, it needs to be encoded as um, just a uh, UA8 array. So we have some helper functions uh, to do that. So um, let's start from the reply. So our example reply, it needs to fit the form example reply. And this is again our generated code matching up with this guy. So our example reply will have the field repeated text. And you know what? Let's actually make that in line. Grab that out of here. So that satisfies the form of the example reply. And now we need to encode it. So we'll make an object called encoded reply. We use our helper encode reply function. We need to have the request ID so that uh, when Unity receives this back, it knows um, what it goes with. That's on the, the wrapper object. And then we need our I reply wrapper object. So we can put example reply in there. And then we can send it back via the WebSocket. And that is everything we need from the uh, TypeScript side in order to uh, handle uh, this message. So now if I go back and build this, all right, we are all set. Now um, we need to go over to the Unity side uh, and handle actually sending this message. So let's go into the Unity subfolder, Unity assets, Bentley scripts, uh, main loop.cs is the function we or file we want. Um, in here, there's the update function. This is uh, what Unity calls on every uh, frame. And we'll add in kind of a hacky thing, just waiting for somebody to push in the space bar. And I usually do my uh, Unity uh, code editing in actual uh, full-on Visual Studio. Um, uh, the IntelliSense is, is much nicer than what you get with VS Code. Um, but for, for now, I'll just do this here in uh, VS Code to stick with one editor. Um, okay, so when uh, the, the user pushes the space button, we what we want to have happen is for them to send that uh, example uh, request that we just defined. So here in our, our Unity code base, we have uh, this uh, member called uh, backend, which uh, handles uh, uh, the routing of, of these messages. So it has a message to send a request and we Find a request wrapper. We put in the example request field. I'm actually going to move this back so we have a little more space. And then I will say my text to repeat equals 
Pizza. So on the Unity side, we send uh, the first object is a, uh, or the first argument to this function is a request um, with the, the request type along with any parameters um, for it. And the second argument is a function to call um, when uh, the request is fulfilled. So from that, um, in that callback, you get this reply uh, wrapper. And the reply wrapper uh, matches up with um, you know, I'm going to unity engine. Keep this happy. Um, matches up to the uh, protocol buffer um, definition file. So it's going to have an example reply field with our repeated text. We'll just log it to the Unity console when we receive this. And that, I think, will do it. A little bit tricky doing this without Visual Studio when you're used to it. But I think I've got it right. Uh, let's see. Compile in the code. Okay, it's satisfied. All right. So let's go back. Make sure our node code is compiled. And we'll just start up with a snapshot. I want a smaller model for, for showing this since we're not doing anything with the model and I want to have my log window um, have less data in it. Okay, so our back end has started. I've loaded this model. Um, and now if I push my camera so I can deselect. Um, if I push space, you'll see I get my repeated pizza message. So every time I'm doing this, I'm sending something to the back end, it's getting it, doing the work, then calling back into our Unity process. And you can see the logging um, that we have in the uh, node process uh, is telling us about the messages it's receiving. Okay, that is the basics of uh, adding a new command. Um, next, we'll go through and look at some of the commands that are already there. All right. Okay, our first um, command is the uh, project extents request. Um, this is pretty simple. Um, all it does is ask for the uh, total range of everything in the I model um, and send it back over so that um, on the Unity side, we can shift all of our coordinates to fit within Unity's uh, uh, single float precision. If you've worked with Unity and CAD models before, you've probably brought something in um, that was very far from uh, zero, zero, zero um, and seen uh, your geometry flip out all over the place. We do this uh, to easily prevent that uh, from happening. You can see on the iModel side what this looks like is pretty straightforward. Um, request. Yep. So we we get this. We we look at the project extent property on the iModel, and we send back uh, the needed information. And then on the Unity side, if we look at coordinate utility CS, you can see how we send this. We talk to the back end, send a request. Our request wrapper identifies it as a project extents request. There are no parameters. Our callback function receives the reply. The reply has the min the max and defines what we need in order to convert our coordinates. Uh, next, uh, let's talk about the camera views request. So 
This uh, is another um, request with no properties. When we send it, we just know we want to get all of the uh, view definitions that have the camera property on. And if you look at it, uh, the function that handles it, that's exactly what it does. It uses EC SQL to query uh, the view definition 3D uh, class, gets the element, and then checks if the camera uh, is on. If it is, it sends back uh, the information about the camera, its uh, display label, um, its orientation, and um, its actual position. Um, this is one of the uh, streaming reply types that I mentioned before, the one-to-many. Um, so for every uh, uh, view definition 3D we find that has the camera on, we send uh, a separate one of these messages. And then when we're done, we send a uh, empty reply to say, hey, this is all of the responses that you're going to get um, for this request. And then if we look on the Unity side, you can see how this is started. We do a uh, send request, no properties, and rather than specifying an anonymous function, we specify an actual delegate function here. Um, and you can see how this checks uh, if there um, are any more uh, streaming replies coming in. Um, but yeah, it, it uses the information uh, and uh, saves these off so that uh, you can toggle between the views once you uh, have them in. Okay, and next let's look uh, at the texture request. Um, this one has one property, which is the element ID of the texture, and sends back two things. Um, one is the, uh, the texture ID so that we know what to name it on the Unity side, um, and uh, the other are the bytes for the uh, texture data, uh, which I believe is a JPEG, if I'm remembering right off the top of my head. Let's see, and all texture request here. So we query for that element, the element we get back has um, uh, the texture element we get back has the bytes for the image stored as data. And that's what we send back. And then on the Unity side, this is used in texture cache, which um, stores. Uh, um, the data uh, for each element ID so that we don't need to send multiple requests. But you can see we use this while loading the, the geometry. We're able to create a, a stub texture. Um, we fire off the request and then when uh, uh, the data is received, um, our callback function uh, fills in the, the texture for us. Okay, let's look next at the tooltip function. So this is what we use um, when uh, clicking on an element to display a little bit of information about it. So this sends element ID, um, our Unity sends element ID, and then um, our node process sends back um, the element ID, the uh, class label, the category label, and the model label. So. Uh, let me show what this looks like. Oops, not the one. Let me show what this looks like in Unity real quick. So when I'm clicking on things here, you can see I'm getting back this information. This is done. All of the elements we pull in have the name. Uh, set to the element ID, and then we have a mesh collider on here. So I'm able to use basic Unity functions to figure out what's under the cursor, send the ID over, get the information back, and display it here. All right, in the interest of time, I won't show the code for that. Um, let's look look at the select element ID requests. So uh, this um, sends a select filter. I'll show what this looks like in the node code in a second. Um, and then sends back a uh, array of element IDs. 
Uh, that's what this repeated field means. So if we look at variable select, you can see our base is select EC instance ID, and then we uh, concatenate whatever the uh, select filter is. And then we send all of that back over to uh, our Unity application. So uh, this is a very generic uh, request you could use to do uh, lots of different things. Um, we actually use this for um, controlling uh, the uh, graphics that are streamed in. You might have noticed that as I moved my uh, camera around in Unity, um, it, it seemed like uh, new things would come in as I uh, moved around, uh, and that's exactly what's happening. Um, we use EC SQL uh, spatial queries in order to um, figure out um, what elements are in uh, the, the view um, and uh, then um, request the, the meshes for just those elements. So this uh, is step one of that. Um, we uh, request the IDs. So this is the actual filter uh, being put together. Here's the request. For them with uh, the callback function. And then um, where these are actually used is in uh, the last and uh, most complicated um, uh, command, which is export meshes. So export meshes, um, the request is actually pretty simple. Um, you send it uh, an array of element IDs and then a um, uh, tolerance for how fine, uh, finely meshed you want the graphics to be. And then you get back um, the element ID of the, uh, the mesh, um, the uh, color for the material, um, how many, uh, and then this is some uh, information about the, the mesh, the, the index count, the vertex count, and the mesh data. Um, I, I'm gonna run out of time to, to get into what this actually is, but basically um, the, the mesh data is stored in a way that's uh, very fast for Unity to process. Um, and uh, let's see, where do we do that? Element mesh reader. We get that data back, um, and uh, I use the uh, Unity uh, job system and some of their nice um, uh, functions that uh, don't uh, perform allocations um, in order to, to get it in um, without uh, generating garbage and dropping frames and all of that. And I think that's all the time I'm going to have to, uh, actually, real quick, let's uh, export meshes request. So uh, the one thing I wanted to mention is all of this is based on the export graphics um, API inside of um, iTwin.js. This is what we use for exporting GLTF, um, exporting out to um, uh, LuminRT under the hood, lots of different things that use this. Um, if you, you look at this API, um, uh, it can do some things that aren't in the Unity sample um, yet. So if you're looking to connect to iTwin.js um, with, with Unity or any other uh, platform, um, this is where I would start personally. Okay, and with that, I think I'm gonna have to move to uh, wrapping this up. So unfortunately, I haven't been able to get through everything that I was hoping to, uh, to today, and I'm just about out of time. But uh, real quick, I wanted to hit on a few things. Um, one is, um, if you've watched this presentation, you may be wondering how do uh, I deploy this to Oculus Quest or HoloLens or any other platform? The answer is you do it the way that you usually would in Unity. Uh, you just pick uh, your platform and go. Um, there's nothing in here um, that prevents uh, this from working on UWP or Android, uh, the platforms for HoloLens and uh, Oculus Quest. Um, there are minimal dependencies, and the dependencies that are there, we verify, do work on those platforms. Um, the other thing I wanted to mention real quick is the performance of this out of the box is not going to really scale to uh, uh, big eye models. Um, and that's because we're creating uh, individual game objects for every element um, in the interest of simplicity and uh, flexibility. Um, in a real application, um, you would want to batch together data or uh, perhaps uh, really restrict how many elements uh, you load in at a time, depending on the platform. There's more information about that in the uh, Unity um, applications uh, readme. Um, 
And uh, if you have any questions about this or um, any other part of the example, uh, I'd encourage you to uh, post it on our uh, GitHub discussions page. Uh, we're actively monitoring and uh, very interested in helping out. All right. Well, thanks, Matt. I appreciate you uh, giving us that comprehensive presentation on how to bring an I model into Unity and, and display it and render it. Um, encourage everybody here in attendance, please put your uh, Q&A in the chats if you have not already there, and we'll, we'll come to that in just a moment. As we're doing so, I, I do have a few questions uh, to uh, ask you to weigh in on here as we're looking at our iTwin platform and, and really trying to prioritize items which are most important to all of you. Um, as an audience. So the first here is just on a scale of one to five, when you look at the, the statement of uh, about visualization and the ability to display models of any size, including very large projects, how important is that as part of a digital twin platform offering to you? So I'll leave that question up for a few moments here. All right, I appreciate you all waiting on that question. One more for you as we're, we're clicking Q&A and then we'll, we'll jump over to that. Um, you know, Matt showed you there within Unity, of course, one of, the, one of the advantages of Unity is you can push to a lot of different platforms, including not just a, a web or desktop, but also into things like AR, VR. Be interested in knowing what type of environments are you building applications for? And if you let us know if it's one or, or multiple there. Okay, as people are wrapping up for that question, uh, Matt, do I still have you there? Uh, I think we're ready to jump into, we have some questions coming in here. Yeah, I'm here. Great. The, the first one, um, so what you showed in the video today was really taking that I model, which has been assembled from a bunch of different engineering design data, aligned and aggregated into a common model, and then you show that streaming into through Unity. The first question we got was in addition to that engineering design model information, can you also work with reality data made from something like a context share? Sure. Um, so this um, example does not work with uh, reality data, but our reality data is in um, the uh, standard uh, 3D tiles uh, format. So you can use, um, uh, there are a few open source projects on GitHub uh, to read um, uh, reality data in. Um, uh, you could uh, uh, give those a, a try. Um, uh, CCM uh, also has um, a uh, plugin for Unreal Engine um, that should work uh, with our data. Um, if you watched um, uh, Microsoft's uh, uh, Ignite uh, conference, uh, in their keynote, they showed our um, uh, iTwin XR application, which is actually built on Unity um, and deals with uh, reality data. Um, for that, we use uh, Microsoft um, Azure Remote Rendering um, and we actually boil the um, uh, 3D tiles down to uh, a single GLTF that works uh, with that system um, just at the highest level of detail. That's kind of a, a brute force approach, um, but that's also something um, that, that would work. Oh, Jason is telling me that he's uh, lost uh, his audio. Um, so. Um, I uh, will we'll try to run through a few of these uh, myself. Um, okay, so let's see. Um, somebody asked uh, if there's anything we could do to make this render faster with large models, um, either on the cloud with a, a more powerful machine or uh, perhaps with uh, rendering strategies to render the, the geometry that's closest to us. So um, uh, yes, there are a lot of things you could do to make uh, th this work uh, uh, well, uh, I think uh, we have a very nice SDK for uh, configuring exactly to your use case. Um, in terms of rendering stuff nearest to you, um, that's actually what this uh, sample does. Um, it 
uh, uses the uh, uh, camera uh, frustum that you have and picks the uh, uh, elements that intersect that and then uh, orders the request by the size of uh, their bounding box. That's not exactly uh, the things uh, nearest to you necessarily, um, but you could uh, shift that around. Um, and I've used a, a similar query uh, when I first did the sample on the uh, first generation Oculus Quest, which was less powerful than uh, what's out there today, um, I just restricted uh, the, the subset that I would request from a, a very large plant model. Um, obviously, not all the geometry was was in there, um, but I was always able to get the geometry that's most was most important to me and uh, have a really nice experience uh, with um, out a lot of effort, to be honest. It's a, a nice way to work. In terms of running... Um, on a more powerful machine in, in the cloud, um, that's uh, uh, pretty much what uh, Microsoft's Azure Remote Rendering uh, service is for Unity. Um, so you could uh, boil your iModel down to um, a GLTF file. Um, that's not a service we provide today, but we do have a uh, test application in the uh, iModel.js uh, mono repo um, called uh, Export GLTF um, that you could use uh, for that purpose. Um, and then you could stream the, the data in that way. Um, and Matt, I, I know we had a, an adjacent question on that relative sure. to just the, the larger question of dealing with huge and complicated models. For, for example, maybe something like an oil and gas asset, which can be, be quite large. Mm -hmm. To that end, um, any I, I think you kind of addressed it with this previous question, but um, any other tips or tricks you might have there, suggestions in terms of being able to uh, render and, and deal with that? Sure, in yeah. Capability? Uh, uh, I could talk on this uh, for, for another uh, few hours, I think. <laughs> <laughs> you got a minute. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll mention real quickly. Um, Unreal Engine um, also has a uh, pixel streaming um, approach for, for running in the cloud. You can actually see they're using that with uh, uh, their uh, amazing uh, MetaHumans uh, uh, project and a few other things. Um, so that would be another approach. Um, we also offer a lot of options in the iModel.js API. Um, in this demo, I'm requesting things at a fixed um, tolerance, but... Um, we, because we store the original uh, geometry representation, you can kind of generate your LODs on the fly. That would be another option. Um, and I, I would be remiss if I didn't mention, um, if you're looking to, to do a conventional web application or um, something uh, where an electron application on the desktop would work for you, um, our standard iModel, iTwin uh, stack um, will work very well for large models. That's uh, kind of our calling card. Yeah, and that's what you're referring to there. We have a uh, packaged visualization module which handles all that for for you there. So it's it's kind of a, more of a plug and play type solution, if you will, right, Matt? Correct. Yes. And that again, if if you're looking to make a web application, that's absolutely where I would start. Great. Uh, got just two minutes left here. Uh, one one generic question that we got was just asking if this session was being recorded. I want to highlight that it is being recorded. I would expect the, this to be available shortly at the same link you used to access the live video today. You can go back there after the video is o or the webinar is over and, and access the recording. And then likewise, we typically put these up on our YouTube channel uh, about a week afterwards. Matt, I think we, uh, and my, my fault, we missed putting a link to this GitHub discussion up on our resource page. So I'll also ask that we go back and add that. So if you were to come back to this page in a little bit, you'll see that uh, link showing up underneath the resources. Um, trying to go through, we only have a minute here left. Um, does this carry through the animation data in the I model? Yes, um, the sample does not leverage this, um, but the animation data is in the I model. Um, it is accessible, um, and uh, that's how we've built uh, the animation integration we have in uh, uh, LuminarT uh, for for Synchro and iTwins. Um, it's also um, we have a. Uh, Unreal Engine uh, uh, Datasmith integration that will be uh, uh, coming out um, uh, very soon. Um, that uh, uh, supports animation, and again, that's how we've done the animation integration there. Yep. Uh, another question we got just in terms of use cases, is anybody using something like this for training purposes yet? So for example, for uh, health and safety training purposes or procedural uh, training. And the answer to that is um, certainly we're, we're hearing a lot of interest in that. I'm, I'm not readily aware myself of, of anybody that's specifically using it for that case yet, but I know I've 
been involved in many conversations where people are looking to do exactly that, be yeah. able to come in and create a AR VR app or otherwise to for training purposes. And, and I should mention, uh, Jason, that we do have folks who are using this uh, for design review applications um, with uh, uh, folks internally. You know, they build production applications uh, based on this sample. So, absolutely, uh, I think uh, doing the health and safety. Uh, the platform would certainly work for that. It's just that uh, we don't know that someone's done that yet. I uh, apologize. We, got, we do have a few more questions we didn't have time to get to today. I'll uh, work with Matt and we'll, we'll follow up individually with those who had asked the questions we weren't able to get to today. But I thank you, Matt, for coming and uh, sharing this with us based on the questions. Seems like a pretty uh, relevant topic for a lot of the folks who were able to join. Um, but do have to close things off. Would refer you all back to the links on the screen here if you'd like to get more information. And with that, I'll thank you for joining and look forward to talking to you next month. Have a good day.